Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, we do these every month. Um, if we're so lucky to have the author join us, and we do this month. So Talia Hibbert, who wrote um, our July official GBC book, which is Get a Life, Chloe Brown. And it is a romance novel. Um, Talia, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and discuss your book. We have lots of questions that have been emailed in or asked through our social media um, about the book and about the books coming up, actually, because you have another one um, being released shortly. Indeed. If it has not already <laughs> been released, I don't have the date in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one that's just come out and then one in a bit. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my first question to you really is if you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into this crazy job of writing. Yeah, um, it was definitely kind of unexpected. I had wanted to be a writer my whole life, but it always seemed like a bit of a pie in the sky dream because I was a bookworm. So authors were like my celebrities and I was like, oh, that's never going to happen. Um, but then when I was in my final year of university, a lot of different factors kind of aligned to push me forward into trying to chase my dream. Um, so I wrote a very, very short romance and I self-published it, whacked it on Amazon to see what happened. And I think one person bought it and I was super excited. <laughs> I made like 40 pence and I was thrilled. So I wrote another one and two people bought that and I wrote another one and quite a few people bought that and I just kind of kept going and things have kept building luckily for me. So here I am. <laughs> awesome. Well, and this one was traditionally published, correct? By Avon Yeah, that's Books. right. It was my first one. <laughs> so what can you explain how that felt when it got picked up I know I know the girly book club is actually full of um women that are they either have a manuscript stuffed somewhere in in a desk or they're they're halfway through their first book or so we'd love to hear a little bit more about what it was like when you um when you got it published through a uh, a regular publisher it was definitely a super different experience because they had such a wide reach and they were able to do so much with distribution and so, you know, as a self-publisher, I'm not super savvy. So I was putting my books where I could, but actually being able to go into a bookshop, like my local bookshop and see my book on the shelf, it just felt so different. <laughs> that probably sounds terrible because all books are books and I'm super proud of all my books, but it felt very different to the little bookworm in me who used to go to that very same shop. Um, and also because Avon does have so much reach, I've just been able to find so many more readers and it's been so lovely connecting with all these people and hearing how they felt about the book. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, is that, that must be, I, I, I'm always amazed at how willing authors are to talk to us. And can you just talk a little bit about what it's like for you going into a community of women who have, are not even women of anybody really? I mean, I, I suppose that you probably appeal more to women than men, but um, going into a community of readers that have actually read your, your stuff. It's just wild to me. It took me a really long time to kind of grasp the fact that I was an author now because obviously I just feel the same as I've always felt. And so to have people kind of, talking to me and seeming like hesitant or nervous like I was a big important person or saying that my book was like important to them and that it gave them feelings that is just my dream come true so it feels kind of surreal when people are saying all these nice things to me but also I just get so happy like sometimes I'm reading messages and I just start giggling because I'm like this is amazing this is the best <laughs> thing ever and I, I don't really get used to it so I mean, hopefully I will eventually, or I'm going to spend the rest of my life floating around like a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't often read romance. Um, is that the genre that you would describe? Like, that's what you write predominantly? Oh, yeah. I'm a hardcore romance fan. Romance forever. Romance for life. <laughs> okay. Well, we don't often read it. And as with lots of genres, most of our community either loves it or hates it. Um, so it's always interesting when we introduce, I mean, the only one we, we kind of get buy-in from most people is historical fiction. 
Um, otherwise, it's always a hit and miss on genres. <laughs> Um, I do have some questions that have come in um, via email, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you one of those. Um, and I've now lost it. Oh, here it is. <laughs> she, write, she writes, it's from Carmel, and she writes, I really like the fact that Chloe represented individuals suffering with chronic pain and coping with illness. Would you agree that romance novels generally ignore real people coping with either mental illness problems or physical illness? Do you hope other novelists will be inspired to represent very real people, highlighting that you can find love regardless of your race, class, disability, or sexuality? Well, that is a great question. And honestly, one of the reasons why I love romance so much is because growing up reading a lot of books, um, I noticed that actually, you know, most, most places in literature, it's always the majority that's represented rather than the, rather than the minority. But in romance, I felt as I got older, like I just had such a wide range of authors to choose from who all had their own lens that they were writing through. And I feel like I've been lucky to read a lot of authors who write about things that are close to my heart and they have diverse characters, whether that's racially or in other ways. And they have queer characters and they have characters coping with mental illness. So I definitely think that that wave of change is happening um, quite quickly now as well. It really seems to have picked up the pace in the last few years. And I'm just really glad to be a part of it. Um, so I actually had another question come in via email and we're getting a bunch of questions in the chat window as well. Uh, and this question, I wasn't sure if I was gonna ask only because it was about another book that you wrote, which was That Kind of Guy. Mm -hmm. And I haven't read that book, so I don't, I don't understand the question um, because it is based a lot on the characters from that book. But considering what we're just covering, I'm going to go ahead and ask. So she writes, it's so rare to see demisexuality explored in books at all, let alone romances. She writes, I've managed to find a few, but Talia Hibbert's That Kind of Guy has resonated the most with me so far, and I want, her thank I want to thank her for that. It feels especially noteworthy to me because it explored the topic before people were discussing it much, and also become, because the Demi partner is male. Judging from what I see on the Demisexuality Reddit board, a lot of Demi guys feel stigmatized and would find Zach empowering. I'd love to know what drew Hibbert to Demisexuality and what inspired Zach and what sort of feedback she's gotten on that. Um, that's a great question and um, that kind of guy is the last book in my Ravenswood series so I'm sure there's quite a few people who won't have gotten to it but yes the hero is demisexual um, and he kind of feels that stigma, stigma that the questioner mentioned especially being a man because there are these societal perceptions of men and their relationship with sex um, and essentially, I'm queer myself, and I always like to kind of represent different queer identities because I feel like we talk about diversity, but then within, within each marginalized category, there's even more diversity again because we're all individuals and we're all experiencing things so differently. Um, so yeah, it just, when I was thinking, what kind of stories can I tell? That character kind of came to me as someone who might be struggling with the way people perceived him, the way he was supposed to be versus the way he was. And yeah, it just seemed to make sense to me that he would be demisexual. Um, and I'm lucky that I had a very, very dear friend of mine on hand who is also demisexual to give me advice and really guide me through making sure that the representation was as good as it could be. So I'm really pleased that the person who wrote in felt that way. Um, and I hope other people do as well. Just to clarify, because I, I'm sure there's some people here who don't know what demisexual means. In my, in my understanding, it is that you, you're, you're not there, you don't have a sexual preference at all. It's, it's about the person themselves. That's pansexuality. Okay. Um, so I don't even Demi, <laughs> no, so I'm sure, like you said, a lot of people probably aren't aware, but um, it's somewhere on the asexuality spectrum where essentially you only develop sexual attraction to someone once you feel like an emotional connection to them. Right, right. So you can't just see someone and be attracted to them. You have to have like something there personally. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to go to the chat window now. 
here we go. Um, okay, so a big question that everybody has is, is Chloe Brown based on anybody in real, that you know, or based on anybody in your real life? Um, no, because if I base characters too much on people in my real life, they'd probably notice and they'd be really annoyed with me. <laughs> um, but Chloe has fibromyalgia and I have fibromyalgia, so I was able to base that part of her experience on my experiences. Um, but other than that, no, I just made her up. <laughs> All right, so that asks, um, that answers a few people's um, questions on that. Uh, I'm just reading the questions. Georgina says she likes the diversity of romance book as well. It doesn't take much effort to find books that explore a range of backgrounds and issues. Okay, here we go. Katie has asked that Talia puts out novels at a quick rate. How far ahead does she work to stay at that pace? Not very. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm a bit disorganized and it's all sort of as and when because I do have to work with my health. There are periods where I can't write very much or very quickly at all. And then there are periods where, you know, especially when things are a little bit difficult, but not too difficult. I might not be able to go out with my friends or take a walk, but I can make up stories and write them down. So during those periods in my life, I write really quickly and then when I'm feeling really great, I probably write less because I'm off doing other stuff. Um, so right now I'm two books ahead of schedule. So I just had Take a Hint, Danny Brown come out. I've written the third book in that series. And I also have another book that I've been working on that's about done as well. Um, but it definitely depends. Um this is my own question, but how important was it to talk about, because there's so many things, like fibromyalgia is definitely one of them, but there are a lot of other um, instances where health practitioners, or if you go to your doctor, they're, you're dismissed. So how important was that to you, um, seeing that you do suffer from fibromyalgia, to explore in your book? Well, I have definitely had my own experiences with that over the years. That was... Um, something that happened to me a lot because I was diagnosed as a teenager and you know being a girl being young being black almost every doctor I saw was like she's attention seeking um, so when I decided to write a character with a chronic illness I knew that I had to touch on that because so many of us experience it and it just wouldn't be the complete story I don't think without kind of referencing that reality we're getting a lot of love in the chat window here <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, Rachel just writes that she struggles with chronic illness and has never seen her, herself represented in romance novels, especially where di disability is something to work with and not something the hero somehow fixes. She said she teared up in a few spots and she just wanted to drop a thank you. Well, thank you for reading and for saying such lovely things. That is just really the best thing that I can hear about that book, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, we do. Sorry, ladies, I'm not ignoring you. We do have two women with their hands up. <laughs> so I will um, ask Linda to go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I loved um, I loved Chloe Brown and then I just finished uh, Danny's story as well. Okay. But I listened to um, Get a Life Chloe Brown on audiobook. And it was extra steamy <laughs> that way, I have to say. <laughs> I was like, I live in Florida and I was riding my bike and I'd be listening to it and be kind of embarrassed as I was like, oh, so <laughs> luckily I stayed on my bike. But that was just a comment. The, um, the question is, in both, I won't give anything away about um, Take Him, Danny Brown, but just in both cases, the romantic, um, the, the male lead also has something that they're struggling with. And that's, I've read a lot of romance novels and that's also atypical, not just for the female lead. So is that a conscious decision on your part to have um, both characters have some flaws or struggles and help each other? Yeah, I think so. Because the thing that draws me to romance is because there are two main characters, whereas in a lot of genres, it's usually just one. It does give you the space to kind of work through multiple personal arcs and then kind of weave them together which I think really reflects how we interact in the real world 
Um, and the books that I prefer do tend to have both main characters kind of working on their own things before they can have their happy ending. So I definitely wanted to emulate that. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Nice to on my bike. <laughs> All right, let's go to Talia. Hi. Um, I just, there was a lot that's happened for me once I found your books, especially because I was like scrolling, I think on Twitter and I found like Talia and I was like, Hey, that's my name. <laughs> um, and I also like really like writing romance. So it's been really nice seeing like someone with my name, with my genre and doing it so well. So thank you for that. Um, but my question was going to be just kind of like, um, when you're writing, how do you kind of like, I guess more so, do you have the idea in your head, like when you're writing or do you kind of have it in your head before you even start writing? Like, is it like as you write or is it like preemptive story ideas and then it kind of comes together? Uh, so this is a, this is a tricky one because for me, it tends to depend on the story. So there are some stories where I guess it kind of marinates in the back of my mind without me even realizing it. So then I sit down and I'm like, oh, I can outline this all right now. Um, and Get a Life, Chloe Brown was one of those books. I completely outlined it. And then I just followed my notes and wrote, wrote the whole thing and maybe made a few changes at the end. Um, but then with other books, like the sequel, Take a Hint, Danny Brown, that one... To outline it. it wouldn't come. I wrote it. I had to rewrite it. I can't seem to put my finger on what the varying factor is. Thanks for answering. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Talia, I just had some internet connectivity problem, but I think it's okay now. Um, Joanne, what do you have to ask? Mute. There. <laughs> okay. Um, one, my question is, um, will a future book um, be set in COVID times and how will that affect your writing? Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to add was I wasn't finished reading the last book, so I happened to send a smattering to my, uh, books to my mom and she chose your book my mom is in her late 70s so I, I asked her well how's the book she says oh it's a cute romance and then I started to read it and and yes it was until I got to page 83 and I'm going oh my <laughs> mother <is doing> this. <laughs> I love that <laughs> it was funny it was lots of fun Thank you. And I love your richness of your characters. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is so kind of you. Um, and as for your question, I have been asking myself that a lot recently because, you know, COVID is something that's still happening. And when really terrible things are ongoing, I kind of question, is it okay to write about this? Because some people are actually going through this right now. So do I feel like it's sensitive for me to do that? But then at the same time, it's something that we are all, to some extent, we are all experiencing it together. And you know, a lot of people, myself included, when I'm experiencing something negative, it often makes me feel better to kind of read a book about it, especially when that book has a happy ending. Um, and then also there's just the fact that this has changed the world and we're never going to forget it. So surely if I am going to continue to write contemporary romance, I have to reference that this is the world we live in now, right? So mm -hmm. I'm really just working through all that. And my answer is right now, I don't know. <laughs> but right. I do know that there are some kind of COVID focused romances that have come out that sound actually really cool to me and I'm looking forward to reading them. So hopefully reading them might help me sort my own thoughts a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah, I can really see you touching on 
the pain that people have, even just being in our homes and four walls and all the emotions that that entails or the limited family, like mm -hmm. grandchildren and not being able to be with them. Those kinds of things I can really see you delving into. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great questions, ladies. We have another question here that says, can Talia talk a bit about the romance industry? There's been so much upheaval lately with RWA and other things. How does she see the industry growing and evolving? Well, as far as RWA, I, I suppose my response was a bit problematic because it all blew up. I kind of read it and thought, this is not something I want to be involved in. This is just atrocious. And then from that point on, I completely wiped it from my mind and now I pretend it doesn't exist. And the trouble with that is, you know, there was a reckoning and now there are some people who have taken over and who are trying to change things and really fix it. And I feel like I'm behind on what they're doing because I was just so horrified by the whole debacle that I, I set it to the side and then I think I got distracted with the COVID thing. Um, so I know that change is happening specifically in the RWA but I'm not super up to date on it. However, I feel like that really coincided with a shift in the romance industry in general. And that I have definitely been noticing. I think it's been a long time coming. There's been this gradual increase in not just diversity, but like vocally questioning the norm and the harmful norms and standards that we've kind of accepted for a long time. And because of that, yeah, I'm seeing a real difference, openness, for example, people talking about disparities and how they're treated and how they're compensated and how they're promoted, depending on who they are and what they write. Um, we're talking about how the romance novels that we read reflect and impact how we move through the real world. So yeah, there's been a lot of change, but I think it's so far all been for the better. And for those of you who don't know, RWA is the Romance Writers of America. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we have so many questions now. Okay. Jen, this is from Jen Jack. Jen, I don't understand the first bit, but it says, do you find it hard to be taken seriously as a romance writer? Oh, I think I understand that because there's always that moment when someone says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. And they say, what do you write? And I say, romance. Um, or even worse, I say I'm a writer and they say, oh, I love books. I'll read anything except romance. And then I have to say, hmm, <laughs> funnily enough, that's what I write. Um, but to be honest, if people don't want to take me seriously, that's a them problem, not a me problem, because yeah, I'm like a that. very serious <laughs> author. <laughs> and I wish that they could experience the joy of the romance genre, but if they don't want to, that's their choice. Very good answer. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Beth asks, the book has some very steamy scenes. Do you find it easy to write those parts or are they more difficult to write? <laughs> um, they are very easy to write when you're in the first draft and you're kind of going with the energy that's been moving throughout the book. But then when you go back and try to edit them and you're not in that kind of first draft excitement phase, you realize what you've written and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like someone else wrote that stuff and I'm reading through it like, good God, woman. <laughs> so that could be a bit tricky. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, Linda has a very interesting question here, um, especially given what's happening in the world right now. She says, I didn't look closely at the book cover since she had a digital copy and she didn't realize that Chloe was black until there was mention of her brown thighs. It made her realize that you didn't intend or you didn't make the interracial element a core part of the story. She wants to know how did you decide how much to address? Um, well, for one thing, it's always interesting to me kind of the moment when readers notice the race of a character when it isn't explicitly stated. Because for me, I have a habit of reading books and assuming that everyone is black. And then when it comes up that they're not, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and I suppose a lot of people do that kind of either for their own race or most people assume that everything they read is white because the majority of the characters are white. 
Um, so I don't kind of write thinking I'm not going to mention that Chloe's black. I write the character in a way that comes automatically to me because obviously she's the same as me. So I don't really mention it because it's just normal. Um, and then people tend to notice it at different points. But in terms of not really making or emphasizing the fact that it's an interracial relationship, again, I think that just comes naturally to me, probably because I'm in an interracial relationship. And so it's not a big deal to me. And my mum's parents are of two different races and that's not a big deal to me. My parents are different ethnicities. So I suppose it's just something that is my normal. And so I write it normally. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Um, again, ladies, if for those of you who have just joined us, we've had a couple people in the last 10 minutes join us. Um, if you want to ask a question live, please feel free to. There is a raise your hand functionality or you're absolutely welcome to type your question in the chat window down below and we will I will ask the question then. Um, the next question I have for you, Talia, is some of your, um, the people that are authors probably, or even specific books that inspired you. Um, we'd love to hear about those. So many authors inspire me because I just, you know, reading is my number one hobby. And especially now I've started writing when I'm reading something amazing. I'm always like, I want to do this. I want to be this good. Um, so the people that I kind of think about a lot when I'm working on a story would be Kennedy Ryan, who all of these people write romance because that's pretty much all I read, um, but they write different types of romance. So Kennedy Ryan writes contemporary romance and her characters have really like rich lives outside of their romantic connection. And that often causes a lot of conflict because they have their own distinct goals, families, priorities, jobs. So I really like that. Um, Tasha Suri writes fantasy romance and her world building and the levels of her imagination and also her language. They are things that I think about all the time and I just wish that I could reach that level of brilliance. Like every time I'm editing and I'm getting tired, I'm like, no, I have to keep going so I can write something that makes me feel the way those books make me feel. Um, I really, really love Charlotte Stein. She writes books that make me feel things really violently. So I tried to capture that. Um, and I am always in awe of Beverly Jenkins, who is like the queen of romance, queen of historical romance, because her plots are so tight and so constantly fascinating and also so real and filled with the kind of detail and research that I could never do. So yeah i'll stop there because i could honestly go on all day but lots and lots of authors <laughs> so you only read romance though has that always been the case no i grew up reading you know anything i could get my hands on and i discovered romance when i was about 12 and i really really loved it but i kept reading lots of other things as well but as i got older and i had more control over what i read you know i could buy my own books instead of having to read whatever the library had in things like that I just found myself reading romance more than anything else. And now maybe because it's my job, I've gone to the point where I just rarely pick other books up, which is probably quite bad, but I'll, I'll work on it. <laughs> um, does, do you think that, do you ever like worry? I always wondered if authors ever worry when they're writing something that like is the same genre that they, they that would, that would influence them too much maybe like not plagiarism, but like, but if you if you read something that was completely out of your wheelhouse, then maybe it would inspire you without the risk of like rehashing a plot or something. No, I know exactly what you mean, because sometimes you write something down, then you come back and read it and you're like, wait, this is just the plot of that film I watched last week. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mean to, but it happened. <laughs> so I think what saves me from that is that I read so much that there's like lots of varied influences all at once. So it's never just a carbon copy of something if I did accidentally copy, but hopefully I don't because that would be terrible. <laughs> um, let's explore the actual book itself and how you wrote it. So obviously you're writing it from two perspectives, but you're also, um, you used emails, you used fantasy. Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, so um, originally, 
the emails weren't actually in the book. I added them quite late on because I felt like something in the connection and like the buildup of their relationship was missing a bit. I felt like because I'd been thinking about them loving each other for so long, I maybe hadn't demonstrated enough of them getting to that part. Um, so I was thinking, well, what would be a perfect way for the two characters like this to connect when they do have, you know, a bit of argument in their past and they do sometimes just start to bicker at that point in their relationship when they're together. And then it occurred to me that it would have to be through some sort of medium. And um, it also seemed cool because, you know, in this day and age, a lot of us do communicate, including romantically through technology. So I thought that was a fun way to move things forward. And it also like spiced things up a bit in terms of different narratives and stuff. So you're still lots of love in the chat window for you. <laughs> um, Georgina says she thinks that you do banter and comedy really well. Thank you. <laughs> Beth is, says that the relationship they had is exactly what she's looking for in a relationship, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you find it. Exactly. Uh, Nicole says she, you, she especially appreciated your skill with dialogue. Chloe and Red's conversation flowed so naturally. Some of their comebacks were so quick and funny and I had many laugh out loud moments. Okay. So Marcia joined us late and she's asking, um, how you did the research into fibromyalgia. And I imagine that it was all based on personal experience. Yeah, I avoid research whenever I can, which is terrible, but yes, I do. <laughs> so no historical fiction then. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, maybe you can discuss a little bit about your, well, we know that um, you have one based on her sister and we don't know much about the next one, but did you always know that it would be a trilogy? Yeah, um, I kind of started by dreaming up Chloe and then once I'd established her character I knew that she would have sisters and so I wanted the sisters to have a book as well because romance readers love getting to see more of the lives of like secondary characters. So, uh, Books and I. Sorry, Talia, can you hear me? I'm having <laughs> Wi Fi problems. Oh, yeah, no, I can hear you. Okay, it's, I, I, can I didn't now. catch I any of that answer. I hope everybody else heard it. <laughs> For some reason, my internet is not doing very well. <laughs> um, based off that question, that answer that I don't know what the answer was, so I'm making a terrible um, moderator here. But Beth would like to know if Red and Chloe make an appearance in the rest of the trilogy. Oh, well, that's just, I actually forgot what the first question was, but that's reminded me. Um, so what I said was that basically, yes, I always wanted the sisters to have their own books. Um, and yes, Red and Chloe do make an appearance. So in Take a Hint, Danny Brown, they show up um, for a little while. And then in the third book, Eve's book, they show up again. And so do Danny and Zaf from Take a Hint, Danny Brown. So yeah, you'll get to see everyone again. <laughs> okay, awesome. So we have another question here saying, do you want any, do you have any advice on someone who wants to write their own book, but isn't really sure how or where to start? Definitely. I would say when you want to write something, usually you have the most skill in the genre that you read and love the most because every time you read, you're like absorbing. Um, so once you choose kind of vaguely what you want to write, read as much as you can in that area. And also it's great to read kind of how to books as well. When I started, um, because I, I tried to write books when I was younger and I'd never finished them. And then I went to university and I was like, oh, if you don't know how to do something, you can go to the library and find a book on it. Maybe I could do that with writing books. So I would definitely recommend searching out advice books. Um, a lot of the time authors in a genre sometimes write their own advice books. So 
start there and see what you can find. And do you, having gone through sort of the self-publishing route to start with, do you recommend that if they can't get, because I mean, it's really hard to find an agent and it's really hard to, to go down the traditional publishing route. Um, do you yeah. recommend that, that experience? Yeah, I had a great time self-publishing. I'm still going to self-publish some of my books because I do quite like it. Um, and the reason that I started self-publishing is because I assumed there was no way that I could get an agent and I couldn't get a traditional deal. And it was definitely the audience that I built self-publishing that got me both of those things. So I would say inform yourself on everything that it is and everything that it can be. And if that seems like the kind of thing that suits your skill set, because it does require a lot of different skills and a lot of motivation, then give it a try, you know, what's the worst that could happen. Absolutely. And there's some amazing stories about, um, well, and yours included, about people that went ahead and self-published and then they were picked up by the big publishing houses. But I mean, even stories of people who were successful just self-publishing, it's, I mean, it's such a different Absolutely. landscape now that it doesn't even, you don't even need Penguin Random House necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, <laughs> her name, but anyways. <laughs> um, okay, so Joanne says she would love a book for Gigi reminiscing on her or narrating her youth. Oh my God, that would be a wild book. <laughs> yeah, Gigi was a great character. Um, Georgina would like to know how influential are romance podcasts for increasing your audience and getting attention from publishers? Um, I don't know about getting attention from publishers directly, but in terms of increasing my audience, there are some podcasts that have definitely had a huge impact. Um, the first one that comes to mind for me is Heaving Bosoms, which is actually one of my favorite podcasts anyway, because <laughs> <laughs> they're great. It's just like super enthusiastic discussion of the book. And I think podcasters tend to be just so into what they're doing and that's the whole reason they're doing it. And that kind of genuine enjoyment of a book is what really gets other readers interested. So I would say podcasts are pretty good for that sort of thing. This is the first time I've heard of a podcast called Heaving Blossoms. Is it Blossoms? Bosoms. Bosoms. Okay. <laughs> Bosoms. <laughs> now I need to check this out though, for sure. I feel like I've Definitely. been missing out. <laughs> There you go. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> so can you tell us anything else about the third book? The, the, you've written the third book and you're working on a different book that isn't part of the trilogy. Are you allowed to tell us anything about that? Is it a standalone or? It is a standalone. It's just, it's actually, um, wait, are we talking about Eve's book or the other book? <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, I am. I am. We know about Eve's book. We know, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe if we could go on to the to the next one okay so the next book i'm working on is actually a free book that i'm writing for my newsletter um just because i had a free book before that i wrote three years ago and i read it recently and i was like this is not good it was the second book that i'd ever written so i was like we're just gonna gently take that out of the public arena <laughs> and i'm gonna replace it <laughs> with something super great. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Oh, that's lovely. That's so nice. Uh, this is a great question for, from Marcia. She wants to know if you had um, any choice in who narrated the audiobook because she obviously listened to it and she said the narrator was very good and Linda agreed that it was super sexy. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely amazing narrator we couldn't have her for the rest of the series i believe because she's going to be on the bridgerton adaptation on netflix so i guess she's booked <laughs> but um i did have some choice essentially uh i was given like a list of narrators who were potentials and i could go and listen to the other books they've done and then come back with my preferences um so yeah as much choice as i'm really qualified to have i think it was it was pretty great <laughs> What about narrating it yourself? Was that ever an option? No, I mean, I hate reading my own books, first of all, <laughs> full body cringe. <laughs> and um, I also actually have, um, because I used to sing, I have damaged my throat oh. and I can't actually speak for very long anymore. <laughs> oh no. 
<laughs> Fair enough. I mean, that's as good a reason as any for sure. Um, I always think it's so interesting when the author, but I, I can't, I get what you're saying. I always, I always wonder how many times they've read their own material or, and then having to go and narrate it for an audio book. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any other questions? So I will read Linda's comment here. She says, I love your energy and I think that your positive energy came, came through in your books. It made them such a fun read. Thank you so much. That's super kind of you. Do try to be positive. <laughs> well, I think that is everything we have for you, Talia. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me and asking such lovely questions. I really appreciate it. I've had a, a super fun time. And we're really looking forward to reading what's next. So, um, so thank you again. And thank you for writing a trilogy because oftentimes we read a book and everybody loves it so much and then there's nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Take care.